Hi everybody, so having watched my previous video, let's do the same now for running a budget surplus and reducing the national debt. Before we look at the pros and cons, let's make sure we're okay with some key terminology, starting with the budget surplus itself, also known as a fiscal surplus. This occurs when tax revenue is greater than government spending in a year. A structural budget surplus is a budget surplus being run at full employment, whereas a cyclical budget surplus is a budget surplus in a boom. Now, in a boom, we expect there to be a budget surplus or at least an improvement in government finances given lower government spending on benefits and higher tax revenues. So whatever that budget surplus is in a boom, that will be the cyclical budget surplus. Whereas remember, the national debt is the total stock of government debt over time. So key terminology there. Bearing all that in mind, it should be very clear that running a budget surplus or reducing a budget deficit and reducing the national debt implies that government spending is coming down and or taxation is rising. Contractionary fiscal policy basically is being used. Another name for these policies is austerity policies. So understanding that, let's now go to the pros and cons of doing this. Well, the major reason that governments around the world tend to use these policies is to improve the state of government finances, to promote more confidence in the current state of government finances. And naturally, by reducing budget deficits or even running a budget surplus if they can get there and reducing the national debt is going to promote greater confidence in the state of government finances. And that should translate into improved credit ratings on government bonds as the government is seen as a less risky borrower. And that means over time, governments can issue lower coupon rates, lower interest rates on their government bonds, making it easier and cheaper for the governments to borrow over time and fund public services, let's say. A major long run benefit, which is what governments tend to go for with policies like these. But also greater confidence in government finances can attract inward FDI. Foreign firms are more likely to invest in a country where government finances are under control. And that's good news for short run and for long run growth. But also, with under control, sustainable government finances, there can now be greater flexibility for fiscal policy whenever it's needed in the future. Again, naturally, if budget deficits are low, budget surpluses are being run, national debt is low, governments could be operating within their fiscal rules, allowing them fiscal headroom, space basically, for fiscal policy whenever it's needed. But also, if national debt figures are coming down, there is going to be less spending on debt interest, less servicing of that debt taking place, freeing up fiscal policy, freeing up higher government spending and cuts in taxation whenever necessary. Now let's think, when is that necessary? Well, expansionary fiscal policy is important for the next economic crisis, whenever the next recession comes. Well now, if government finances are under control and sustainable, there is that space to afford those policies. If there is emergency funding of public services needed, that can be afforded. If maybe emergency spending is necessary to deal with income inequality, that can be afforded. So another major benefit here, that fiscal headspace benefit of keeping government finances under control. But also, free marketeers would argue with less debt fueled government spending, there'll be less crowding out of the private sector, less detraction of private sector investment because there won't be as much pressure on demand in the loanable funds market, keeping interest rates relatively low, allowing private sector firms to still borrow at lowish interest rates and fund their investment projects. Good news for growth, short run and long run, but also good news for balanced growth in the economy. But also there'll be less X inefficiency, less wasteful spending, given that governments often let costs get out of control when it comes to infrastructure projects in particular. And lastly, if these policies do reduce AD, then we could see lower demand pull inflation and also improvements in our current account deficit, lower AD, which means uh, lower incomes, then that could mean lower spending on imports. So there are macro objective benefits in theory that can come if we see a reduction in AD. But there are significant cons to bear in mind as well. By far the biggest concern is that if these policies are used very strongly and both simultaneously, then they could shock the economy into a deep recession on the demand side. By reducing aggregate demand, we could see lower growth, higher unemployment, lower living standards. Yes, a demand side shock, recessionary outcomes. This will be the worst consequence and something governments certainly would want to avoid. You want to get these pros, but without shocking the economy into a deep recession. But also, you can go more precise. You can worry about the specific micro and other macro impacts of cutting government spending and raising taxation. Take cuts in government spending on education, on healthcare, on infrastructure, public sector wages and welfare. 
On the micro level, worry about the individual impact. If you cut government spending on healthcare, that might mean longer wait times to see your GP or to get emergency surgery. You're living in pain as you're waiting. It might mean lower quality of healthcare if less doctors and less nurses are recruited or if they're rushed because of the huge demand given cuts to their funding. Uh, if it's lower government spending on education, maybe that means larger class sizes. Maybe it's less teacher recruitment. Maybe it's poor quality of teaching that you see. Maybe it's fringe education services. Certain subjects are not offered by schools because they can't be afforded. Or maybe it's special education needs services that can't be afforded. What about those students who need uh, learning support services, right? So we can worry about the impact on students with lower government spending on education. Lower spending on infrastructure, if that's public transport, what about those people who rely on public transportation? Lower spending on welfare and public sector wages can harm living standards, can't they, for those people who rely on welfare, who, who work in the public sector. And even the micro impact of tax rises, whether they're regressive taxes going up or direct taxes like income tax, you can worry about living standards. That's all on the micro side, the individual impacts. But even on the macro side, cuts to government spending on all those areas, increases in direct taxation like income tax and corporation tax can harm the long run productive potential of the economy, can harm LRS, constrain it, and thereby constraining productive capacity. That can harm long-term growth rates and long-term prosperity. But also these policies can harm productivity and competitiveness. Take government spending on education and health, big links to productivity there and competitiveness. Even raising taxes like income tax, corporation tax can harm competitiveness and productivity, not things you want. You could also argue a little bit linked to these points that these policies here could ignore maybe the long-term tax revenue returns from higher government spending and lower taxation. The idea that these policies boost, yes, short-term growth, but they also boost long-term growth. They create activity in the economy. They create output in the economy, which then will generate tax revenue returns back to the government. So yes, short run, there might be concerns with these policies, the worsening of government finances, but there are returns back in the long run. Some people will argue that policies that try to get a budget surplus being run ignore the long run returns that these policies actually provide. And also lastly, we can worry about the incentives distortion specifically of higher direct taxation. If we go on the income tax side, we can bring in Laffer concerns and how there is a lower incentive to work, lower incentive for economically inactive people to join the workforce, a lower incentive to be entrepreneurial, uh, a greater incentive for people to leave the country, emigration, and a greater incentive for tax evasion and tax avoidance to take place. All of that can harm actually tax revenues coming into the government. Laffer would argue it might even mean lower tax revenues for the government, but also we can worry about that long run impact, the supply side impact, constraining LRES, constraining productivity as well. But also if you raise corporation tax, you are reducing the incentive for private firms to invest. Bad news again for long run tax revenues, but also for the productive capacity of the economy. And also some of these policies can risk increasing income inequality if government spending on benefits is cut, if regressive taxation goes up. Not a desirable consequence there. But let's now evaluate one of the pros or the cons likely to outweigh the other side. Well, first we can question whether it's necessary to use these policies. Is it really necessary to run a budget surplus or to reduce the national debt? Well, if government finances are already in a very bad way, they're operating outside their fiscal rules, or the figures themselves just look really bad, really, really high budget deficits, really horrible looking national debt, then of course, absolutely there is a need in that situation. You could argue the pros are outweighing the cons in that situation. But if government finances are already uh, relatively stable, they're relatively sustainable, they're not looking too bad, then probably the opposite is true. The cons could easily outweigh the pros there. Uh, but second, we can make a very interesting point here which is could these policies actually end up worsening the look of government finances? The way we measure national debt is debt to GDP, looking at total national debt relative to our GDP. Now, if these policies are used so strongly that they reduce GDP, they shock the economy and reduce GDP, even if national debt is coming down, if GDP is coming down at a quicker rate, debt to GDP ratios could actually be rising. Government finances could look worse in which case you're getting the cons and you're not really getting the major pros that governments want from these policies. Uh, a really nifty evaluation point if you go too hard with these policies together.
We can worry about the policy used. Now, bear in mind the specific policies used carry specific pros and cons. We've already covered that. But also you can go a bit deeper and say, look, we don't have to use both at the same time if we balance our policies. So for example, there are cuts to government spending, but at the same time, we're not raising taxes. We're keeping taxes relatively low, and that can mitigate some of the cons, but you could still get some of the major pros. And lastly, the stage of the economic cycle, absolutely huge. You could argue that when the economy is booming, maybe that's the time these policies are worthwhile because they can cool down an overheating economy. They can reduce inflation, which is desirable in a boom. But also you could argue that's the time to mend government finances when economic growth is already pretty high, unemployment is already pretty low. There isn't going to be as much damage there to other macroeconomic objectives. Whereas in a recession, are these really the policies you need? You could argue not. Keynesians would certainly argue not uh, because that could push the economy further into recession with further uh, harms to growth and increases in unemployment. Keynes would say no in a recession. That's the time where you take on a budget deficit. You take on government debt to try and close the negative output gap and return the economy to full employment. So uh, an interesting evaluation point to consider there too. So that, guys, covers everything you need to know with what is a fascinating topic area, a fascinating discussion. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you all in the next video. Thank mm -hmm. you.